Welcome to the TaxCast from the Tax Justice Network. Around 20 minutes each month of news, scandal and analysis you won't find anywhere else. With me, Naomi Fowler. The TaxCast is available to everyone on www.tackletaxhavens.com. It's also on the Tax Justice Network's website, www.taxjustice.net forward slash TaxCast. You can subscribe to our RSS feed to the Tax Justice Network's YouTube channel, email me on naomi at taxjustice.net, look for us on iTunes, or find us on a radio station near you. Coming up later, how offshore's ruining the beautiful game. The latest Tax Justice Network research on sports is about to be launched. But first, here's the Tax Justice News Roundup. Some good news. The European Union has told Amazon that their tax deal in Luxembourg is anti-competitive, breaks global rules and could constitute illegal state aid. Luxembourg apparently approved what the EU calls a cosmetic tax deal with Amazon in just 11 days. Thanks to the whistleblower Antoine Deltour of so-called LuxLeaks, there are more companies in the firing line. Speaking of Antoine, there's a powerful campaign on the way, so watch this space. And wonder, dear taxcasters, why PricewaterhouseCoopers and Luxembourg tax authorities are walking into a trap by prosecuting him when the leaks were so clearly in the public interest. Does Luxembourg really want a prisoner of conscience in its jails? In Switzerland, another whistleblower, Rudy Elmer, seems to have come to the end of his houndings through the courts, which have found him guilty of breaching Swiss banking secrecy laws. He's avoided any further time in prison, and now he's decided to go into politics. That'll be interesting. Powerful US tech giants like Google and Amazon have begun the fight back in earnest against global talk of making them pay fairer taxes and operate transparently. Lobby groups representing them are pushing back against proposals that they report their business activities on a country-by-country basis. Google's even reported to have given the low-tax, no-tax Cato Institute free web advertising. In the United States, it seems banks can be as naughty as they like, get criminal convictions and yet still have the right to trade exactly as before. But this time, there's been an unusual public hearing where civil society has challenged whether Credit Suisse should be granted a waiver for business as usual. More on that later. Meanwhile, Credit Suisse offices have been raided again, this time in Milan. Credit Suisse denies wrongdoing and says it's cooperating with authorities. In Kenya, the sky's about to fall in. Well, that's according to investors who are up in arms about the Kenyan government's outrageous decision to introduce a new capital gains tax and the extortionate rate the government wants to collect for the good of the nation, 5%. Despite the pressure, the government's holding its nerve and refusing calls to delay the tax. Companies who want to bid for public contracts in Slovakia will soon have to publish who their real owners are in a special register. Owners from secrecy jurisdictions will not be accepted. Lawmakers elsewhere take note. And on the tax cast roll of dishonour this month, another bank, another raid. 100 Argentinian officials raided HSBC Argentina this month and Argentina's central bank has suspended HSBC Argentina's right to transfer money abroad for 30 days due to irregularities. The bank denies any wrongdoing and is cooperating with authorities. The Cayman Islands government has announced it will not be implementing a central or a public register of beneficial ownership information, something the British Prime Minister's called on all the UK's Crown dependencies and overseas territories to do. And finally, the UK government looked like it was going to introduce a new strict liability offence for holding undeclared wealth offshore. It would have meant just receiving undeclared income from offshore would have been a criminal offence without the need to demonstrate intent. But that measure seems to have been quietly dropped from the latest draft. Now we're going to talk to John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network for his take on this month. OK, John, let's start with Credit Suisse, our old friends. Credit Suisse AG pleaded guilty to criminal charges last year, paid 
$2.65 billion fine for helping US citizens evade billions of dollars in taxes over decades. There's been a fascinating public hearing in the US Department of Labour. Tell us about this hearing. What's been going on there? Well, first of all, this, this of course, is the week when President Obama gave his State of the Nation speech and identified that America, like the rest of the world, suffers from this massive problem of tax avoidance, huge concentrations of wealth amongst the elites. But let's remember that he was one of the signatories of the 2006 Stop Tax Haven Abuse Act. And as he tries to claim a legacy in the second term of his presidency, it perhaps good for us to remind ourselves that this is an area where, frankly, he hasn't made a great deal of success. And the prosecution of Credit Suisse signals the lack of success, because what it shows is the gap between the rhetoric of what happens on the Hill, all the kind of warm messages we hear about tackling tax avoidance and tackling tax evasion and taxing the rich, and what happens done at ground level. Because, yes, Credit Suisse have been found guilty of a felony, or felonies, soliciting and enabling tax evasion on a truly industrial scale. What happens next was that Credit Suisse should automatically, under US law, once it received its conviction and was fined, the 2.6 billion, by the way, is a very, very light fine for the scale of activities involved, it should automatically lose what's called its privileged professional status, um, which in America is called qualified professional asset management status. However, in practice, it turns out, since 1997, the US Department of Labor, which administers this qualified professional asset management status, has repeatedly set aside the regulations that sanctions should automatically apply and has granted waiver to 23 banks, all of which have been granted a waiver, so the sanctions don't apply. What's different this time is that civil society has stepped in. A coalition of civil society activists, including the backed coalition, which Tax Justice Network USA is a member of, and leading campaigners like Ralph Nader and Jim Henry of the Tax Justice Network and many others have actually stepped up and challenged the Department of Labour to a public hearing. And, and this is the first time this has happened and this is the first time where civil society has had an opportunity to testify against the granting of a waiver. Hooray. Now, if this challenge succeeds, and we don't know the status at the moment, this could have major repercussions, not only for Credit Suisse, which will no longer be able to manage uh, the higher risk transactions on behalf of pension funds, which effectively closes them off from the US pension fund market, but it will also send out really strong messages across the entire American banking industry, which for a long time has known that if they are convicted of a felony, they're likely to get only a light fine and they can walk away with impunity. But if civil society is able to pressure the Department of Labour to not waiver the sanction this time, that will send out really strong messages. Maybe, at last, we'll see the tide turning against the criminals within the banking industry. Just to add, Credit Suisse even said that uh, none of their pension clients, and they said this in the hearing, that none of their pension clients to date had fired them over this criminal plea, and in fact they'd won even more business. <laughs> and while we're on the subject of uh, the state of the US in terms of uh, international compliance in some of the new transparency measures that the Tax Justice Network's been so busy trying to uh, campaign on, we should point out, shouldn't we, that while 91 countries are now scheduled to take part in automatic information exchange programmes, there is one country that is not committed whatsoever to any kind of multinational in information exchange, and that is the United States. Which is sending out a very clear signal across the world that if people want to evade tax, they can stop looking to Switzerland and other countries because the United States is going to become the tax haven of choice for people who are looking for the loopholes that they've been able to exploit for years. Very strong signals are being sent out to the legal community and to the banking community. Guys, it's business as usual. OK, so let's move on now and look at the United Kingdom because their register of beneficial owners of companies is set to open next year in 2016. It means that companies will have to file information about 
PSCs, those are persons of significant control of companies. All sounds great, but they're going to allow for applications to preserve anonymity. I did a double take when I read that. Yes, so we're going to have a disclosure regime, but the disclosure regime is going to allow people to apply and not disclose. Oh dear. So what at first glance looks like a good news story, which is that from January next year, all companies in the UK and dependent territories must keep a register of uh, what are now being called the persons of significant control. That means the people who exert significant control over a company, either through ownership or through voting rights on the shares. And by April 2016, this information will have to be filed at the UK company's house. So the government will have access to that information. This is a, a step forward. But we must now look at the caveats, because what we're seeing is, first of all, is that the, the threshold for requiring these persons of significant control to register is set at 25%. So only people who have 25% of the shares or 25% of the voting rights in the company will be required to be registered by the company as persons of significant control. And that's an extraordinarily low threshold to set right from the word go. Because it just means, for example, that a family of five people running some kind of dodgy outfit can all have equal shares, 20% each, and none of them fall into that category. Or 24%. <laughs> or 24%. So we're sending out a very strong signal. Chaps, just make sure you don't pass the 25% threshold and you're home and dry. It makes it far too easy for people to get round the controls. A second area of concern lies with this, this government sending out a message now that anyone who feels that disclosure might place them at risk of intimidation will be able to apply ahead of buying the shares for anonymity, non-disclosure. Now, this whole thing is riddled with slippery possibilities. Past practice has shown us that these things very quickly um, get degraded and anyone and everyone who doesn't want to show that they own us will claim that some kind of intimidation might apply. We, we've heard for years, for example, silly stories coming out of the legal community that disclosing our ownership of this company might uh, lead to our daughter being kidnapped on the way back from school. Now, frankly, this just isn't plausible, but these are the type of things that the lawyers push forward when they're seeking an exemption in this area. And the final reason why I think we, we can't at this stage jump for joy is because at this stage the UK government is not requiring that once information has been disclosed to Companies House, Company House will put that on public register. Journalists will still have to go to Companies House and give strong reasons for why they should have access to that information. And that, again, presents us with a, a major barrier to any civil society organisation or journalists wanting to investigate who actually lies behind these companies. So for all of these reasons at this stage, I think this is a very, very slight move forward, but nothing that we can cheer about at this stage. And what about trusts? Are they included or not? It is far, far too easy for people to own shares in a company through a trust, particularly an offshore trust, and not require disclosure. At this stage, we simply do not know what the UK government is going to determine on the matter of trusts, and there potentially is a massive loophole, and I've no doubt that lawyers will be pushing very heavily, first of all, to make sure that many trusts are going to be exempted, and, and secondly, that they'll be encouraging their clients to own shares through offshore trusts. OK, so we'll look out for that one. <laughs> so it's Davos time again. We've got the so-called great and the good flocking to that bastion of transparency and good banking practice, Switzerland. Well, I think it's time that someone stood up and said, look, Davos is a busted flush. It really is the kind of heart and soul of a failed experiment of 20th century economics and politics. It's the kind of epicenter of what's known as supply-side economics. The whole idea being it's for the private sector to lead, roll back on the state, cut taxes, encourage private sector investment, encourage innovation. This is the way for the future. Very much the kind of Reaganite, Thatcherite process of the 1980s and 1990s. Let's now say it loud and clear, 
that experiment has failed. And then we have the Oxfam report, which came out this week and which shows the extraordinary failure of the Davos, the World Economic Forum kind of mantra. What Oxfam has revealed that, um, is that last year, at the end of last year, 1% of the global population now owns close to half, 48% of all global financial assets, and the bottom 80% own just 5%. This is the outcome of 40 years of cutting taxes on the rich, paying the rich massive subsidies and massive incentives, and the end result is, of course, the rich have become very much richer and the rest of the world has become very much poorer. And Oxfam is saying worse than that, in just two years' time, in 2016, the top 1% will have more wealth than the rest of the 99% of the world. And this is a shocking, shocking statistic. Wealth is not trickling down, as was promised by Reagan and was promised by Thatcher and all of their disciples. And I use the term disciples because this is not a, a proper rigorous exercise in economics. It was always a faith system, a belief system. Private sector investment is not leading the recovery. What we're seeing is massive speculation, particularly in the property markets, and rent-seeking activity across the world. Thanks, John. John Christensen of the Tax Justice Network. Now it's time for the TaxCast special feature. Offshore finance has come to dominate every aspect of our economy, and sport is no exception. This month, the tax cast looks at how financial secrecy and the use of offshore is corrupting the beautiful game. Sports is really the place where competition is the most important thing. I mean, it is fundamental to the activity. And if we're shifting competition away from the athleticism, the skill, the talent of the players, and into the skill and the talent of accountants, lawyers and bankers and boardroom executives, then the sport quickly becomes a very pointless thing to go and watch. The Tax Justice Network's George Turner. We've seen many scandals over the past few years, most prominently involving FIFA and corruption and corruptions of officials. And really what's sitting behind all of this, and similarly to the corruption of the economy, is the offshore system, which allows for corrupt payments to be made. And over the years, we've seen an increasing penetration of offshore finance into sports, which we believe is uh, detrimental to the game. So that's why we as the Tax Justice Network have started a project called the Offshore Game to look at the influence of offshore finance on the sports world. So forget the football leagues as you know them. Stay tuned to find out how you can get hold of the Offshore League that's about to be released and find out which clubs are at the top of that because the first project of the offshore game will be looking at the level of offshore finance in the professional football leagues of England and Scotland, where in the last 10 years an increasing number of clubs have been taken over by offshore entities. But let's start at the top with football's international governing body, FIFA. Here's some fun facts for you. FIFA's a non-profit entity registered in the secrecy jurisdiction of Switzerland, where it pays hardly any tax and doesn't have to apply anti-money laundering regulations. It makes billions in profits on events like the World Cup, yet insists in advance that its events must be tax haven bubbles. It's riddled with scandals, and it's got a corruption charge sheet as long as my arm. Tax justice campaigner and football fan Richard Murphy's been on FIFA's trail for years. FIFA, because it was based upon the idea of being a charity, goes around the world saying, oh, but because we're this special organisation, we can run football tournaments and we shouldn't pay tax on the profits we make from them, even though it is glaringly obvious that FIFA is a very profitable organisation. 
What is more, we should not have to pay any taxes on our staff if they work in your country whilst they're running our incredibly profitable sporting competitions. And those who are supplying us with services shouldn't have to pay tax, and on and on and on. And so we end up with the absurd situation that things like the World Cup are run on the basis of no tax being paid, even if located in South Africa, where very clearly that imposed a cost on South Africa, as the Brazilian World Cup did on Brazil. They didn't get tax to help compensate for that. And back in Switzerland, where the head office is located, where we have heard so many stories over such a long period of time with regard to financial probity, whether proven or unproven, the stories continue to run, that, again, there is an environment where no tax is paid because of the special structure FIFA has. Should people worry about that? Yeah, I think everybody should worry about that. Everybody from the honest supporter of Ipswich Town, in my case, onwards, because this is distorting sport and it's distorting the values in sport. And we have all seen how money has distorted the way in which football is run. So that's how the top brass are carrying on. And now the clubs are getting in on this type of action in a way that should be of increasing concern to fans. Here's another fun fact. George Turner's discovered the largest of the British Virgin Islands now has more teams in the Football League than most towns and cities in the United Kingdom. And it's not necessarily the ownership that's the problem. A few years ago, the Football League in the UK introduced a rule which said clubs needed to tell people who their beneficial owner was. If an individual held either directly or through anonymous companies a certain proportion of the club, then they needed to declare that to the Football League. But the problem is that finance is more than about just ownership of shares. And many of the football clubs have a large amount of debt. They're borrowing money from offshore vehicles in faraway places about which we can find out nothing. So that should be of real concern to fans. If a club goes bankrupt, that's possibly one of the worst things that can happen for a fan. It means that the club can't buy new players. It means that they'll be relegated normally, if, uh, depending on the rules of the league. It means that they'll probably have to sell a lot of their highest value players. In extreme cases, they have to sell their ground. And in some cases, it can mean the club ceasing to exist altogether. The addition of offshore finance can add a significant amount of risk and put these institutions, which are really holding the hopes and dreams of sometimes hundreds of thousands and millions of people, into a precarious situation. And I think fans often don't know, they're not aware of some of the complications that can arise when clubs start to get into more aggressive or exotic financial structures. And behind this increased use of offshore in football is, of course, our old friend tax avoidance and the cloak of secrecy offshore provides it. Richard Murphy. The most common reason why a club will be borrowing from an offshore company is that the owner is themselves offshore. What they will be doing is either using money that they have through their business activities somewhere in the world, managed to accumulate offshore, untaxed, and which they don't want to bring back into any authority where it may be taxed. So instead, they lend it from offshore to the club that they're trying to buy. And that means that they can keep the funds technically offshore whilst lent onshore, which as a result, does not give rise to a tax liability for them. Or secondly, they will be working with other people they have met through their international business trading who do have funds offshore. Now, there are obviously networks of offshore funds which are arising both legally and illicitly, and often it will be very difficult to ever tell the difference from the information that is available on public record, because, as we know, information is very scant indeed on who owns money offshore. So the result is that the offshore money, which will have been accumulated to avoid tax, that's the one thing that we could be fairly sure about, is being lent into a location where tax would have been paid 
in a way that guarantees that no tax arises. So all these offshore structures are designed at the end of the day to make sure there is no tax bill and nothing will be paid as a consequence and that the clubs that are acquired will also not be liable to tax. Frankly, football and tax seem to not go together very well at all these days. Tax avoidance is a key part of the whole structuring of the modern football game, all of which distorts competition and actually is eventually a cost to the private person who just wants to watch a decent game of football. You know the old saying, don't look a gift horse in the mouth? or, in the case of your football club, a rich benefactor. But actually, fans should, because they definitely ain't the gift horse they may seem. And they tend to bring some cutting-edge business techniques with them that could endanger their club. George Turner has a cautionary tale. The real issue with tax avoidance in football is that it can be seen as a way of achieving a competitive advantage and therefore certain risks are taken and those risks can be detrimental to the club. Now, Rangers were one of the most famous teams in the world, Glasgow Rangers. The 140-year history, they had won the European Cup in the early 70s and for many years had been at the commanding heights of European football. In In the early 2000s, around 2001, Rangers decided to start paying their players differently. Instead of just paying the players a salary, they would place the money in a trust in Jersey. And then that money would be loaned to the players and therefore that avoided paying income tax. The revenue and customs in the United Kingdom challenged the scheme. They said that this constituted uh, an illegal tax avoidance scheme and that the Rangers owed £35 million in back taxes with interest and a further £14 million in penalties. And this, coupled with a few other reasons, ended up in the club going bankrupt. And essentially, Rangers ceased to exist in the same form that it did before. There was a a rescue package. It, it, It still plays a football club, but it was relegated right to the bottom of professional football and the battle's been going on for five years in the courts and it's still going on. Okay so let's get back to this report you've produced released very very soon by the Tax Justice Network. I can't say too much at this point can I but you're going to be revealing some very interesting things about some big name clubs famous around the world like Manchester United, Manchester City, Arsenal, Tottenham Hotspur Again, stay tuned and we're going to tell you how to be the first in the queue to get your copy and finding out which teams are at the top of the Tax Justice Network's offshore league table. So, George, the future of football seems pretty grim with these kind of corrupting practices. There's got to be a better way of doing things, right? We have to get to a place where clubs are run for the benefit of fans in the financial interest of fans. Now, in Germany, for example, they have a system where over 50% of the shares in every football club needs to be owned by the supporters. It seems to me that that is a really good system because it means that the people who really have the long-term interests of the future of the club are the fans and, and the custodians of the club. That's what I'd like to see is actually much more supporter ownership of clubs, much more supporter involvement in the way that things are managed. And what that will mean is a, is a change in attitude in boardrooms and really see it as an institution which promotes fierce competition and the best results on behalf of the supporters. It's really quite sad that we've ended up in a place where something which should be about fun and enjoyment and people's dreams and the fraternity of sport has ended up being about bribery and corruption and illicit financial flows and there's a real kind of nastiness and bad taste in the mouth. And you can be first in the queue to see the Offshore Games first report when it's released by going to their website www.theoffshoregame.net 
You can sign up for that right now and follow them on Twitter handle The Offshore Game. You've been listening to the Taxcast from the Tax Justice Network. We'll be back next month. Thank you.